Okay, good morning, everybody. We are going to get started. I am Matt O'Donnell, the Tech Innovation Specialist and Secondary History Content Coordinator at SCO. And uh, I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves. Ryan, you want to start? Yeah, I'm Ryan Knutta, and I teach TKK at a PBL elementary school in Katadi Run Park. Also support teachers with project-based learning. And I'm Anna Babarande, and I'm the Coordinator for Science Education at SCO. Hi, I'm Kelly Materi, and uh, my title's long, I won't bore you with it, but um, my role is to support equitable access to education for kids across content areas. I'm gonna share my screen so we can get the presentation for you. Um, as we go along, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, they will, uh, Kelly and Anna and Ryan will monitor the questions and we'll get to those at the end, um, but put them as we're going and we'll, um, we'll catch up to them. Um, one second, computer's a little delayed here. Okay, so to start out with, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what is this project that we are about to embark on. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to our session. Um, we're super excited to help you launch a project-based learning unit, PBL as we call it, um, focused on the topic of community for the start of the new school year. So um, as you know, we're all living in very interesting times where we may not be able to see our students face to face and um, social emotionally it's going to be interesting so this pbl unit will support you in building classroom community classroom community developing relationships and in really engaging your students in meaningful learning while addressing your core academic and uh, collaboration skills with your students what's awesome about this project is that's going to really elevate student voice and allow your students to become the leaders and have them propose ideas about what they want for their community and the things that the final products that your students will create are presented to a public audience of your choice. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And this topic of community, um, it's so holistic and highly customizable to your grade level and your student needs, and your subject areas. And the SCO team here um, will talk about what professional development they'll offer you as you implement this project. All right, so this is a really uh, awesome graphic that goes over projects and PBL, and it's good to think about it between um, the dessert and the main course. So traditional projects, the dessert, instruction and learning happens before the project. The project is the dessert that comes after the instructional meal. Now, traditional projects are great. We all do them as teachers, but this isn't PBL, uh, but to shift that focus to PBL, the main course, instruction and learning happens through the project as a means to solve or answer a real world question or problem. So the project is that um, hearty main course. That's where the heart of the learning happens, not at the end, it's not dessert. So you as a teacher, you're gonna identify your student learning, need, learning needs as they figure out products to create to solve or answering that, answer that problem or um, challenging question. You plan instruction based on those needs and help guide your student research. So you're a facilitator with that. So the resource that you might curate for your students to solve that um, driving question that's in, that's in alignment with your standards may include texts, primary documents, uh, videos, writing, hands-on investigations, interviews with community experts, field work, and obviously during this time where it is safe to do so as examples. And throughout this project, um, consistent feedback will be given to your students. You're gonna provide feedback on their learning and their progress. You're gonna um, facilitate time for your students will give feedback to each other. And so assessments are embedded throughout and we'll talk about rubrics um, that SCO will provide you with and help you su support with that. And it's all gonna be in alignment with your academic standards and um, the team skills of your students. And so at the end of your PBL unit, um, your students, what your students create are going to be assessed and it'll be presented to a public audience. And the students will also have the opportunity to reflect on their experience to really solidify their learning. 
And just to end this slide with um, the why of project-based learning. Why did we choose um, project-based learning as the main methodology for this project? Um, you know, it's always good to know why we're doing what we're doing. So the research shows that PBL has positive outcomes to student engagement. And as you all know, what we experienced in the spring, that um, it can be harder to engage students online and project learning uh, will significantly help with that. Um, PBL helps knowledge retention, problem solving skills, and the transferring of new skills to um, real world situations. One of the things that's not on the slide um, is assessment for at the top in traditional projects, you would just assess the, the project at the very end. And in this, there really should be a line that shows assessment, as Ryan said, going all the way through it. There's gonna be different benchmarks where you are doing assessment and you're giving feedback to students and you're grading the entirety of the, of the project, not just the final presentation. Mm -hmm. So as Ryan said, one of the reasons we wanted to to change to project-based learning is during the last year, um, some people at SCO and some different um, businesses and the CTE Foundation were involved in creating the portrait of a graduate to find out what are the skills that students need when they graduate from high school, no matter what school they go to in Sonoma County. And they had input from, from community members, from teachers, from administrators, from uh, business people. And they came up with these ideas that students need curiosity, empathy, communication, collaboration, ethics and initiative. And we often hear from teachers and from parents that these are the skills we want. Yet most of our, as Ted Dentersmith talked about last night, most of the things that we assess students on are the things that are easy to assess, like ELA and math. Um, so how do we assess these things? How do we give students an opportunity to practice these things? Because many times they don't have the opportunity to practice these things. And with the shift to distance learning um, and some of the disruption that we have in education, it gives us a great opportunity to pivot to look at the portrait of a graduate as some of the skills that we want to um, embed throughout what we're doing and help our students achieve. And we believe this project is going to help them do that. Kelly, you're on mute. All right, sorry about that. Um, rookie move. Uh, so uh, uh, you may be asking yourself, why should my students participate? Um, particularly in, in the fact that um, kind of looking at it twofold. One, there's already so much transition and, and upheaval going on. Why on earth would I embark on a project-based learning course or direction right now? And then also, um, are my students up for this or am I up for this? Um, and I, I was actually just talking with, with Anna and um, Matt and Ryan before before session officially started. And I was saying that the phrase change begets change has been going through my mind a lot. And the fact that during times of upheaval, um, during times of change and transition that we're in, like we're in right now and uncertainty, it is important to have some things that are touchstones and routine that we can count on. And it's also a wonderful opportunity to shift practices and to put in new um, skills and behaviors, both for us and for our students, um, that, that are different than we had before, rather than trying to rep, because no matter what, we're not going to be able to successfully replicate what it's like to be in the classroom with our students. Um, and then also there are some things about how we've traditionally done that we maybe don't or shouldn't replicate. Right. So this is an opportunity, I think, to um, Anna used the phrase, um, what can we do because of where we're at right now, rather than in spite of where we're at right now with COVID and, and distance learning and the potential for hybrid learning. Um, I, I think this is actually a great time to try something new. Um, and then also um, this project, we've really been trying to um, think carefully to create something that works well for distance learning. It can work well for hybrid learning and it can work well for transitioning between the two, right? Um, and so you don't have to worry like, well, I don't even know what my context will be as the year goes on. That's okay. Um, we're, we're trying to design in a way that, um, that allows for both. And then um, also I wanna speak in the next slide will help me speak to it too. Just what your students can get out of that. So Matt, if you can click forward to that. Um, our students have an opportunity to learn authentic collaborative and communication skills and all of those attributes described in the portrait of a graduate that Matt shared um, and to do it in a way that's authentic, right? So a lot of times, um, myself included, um, when I was like 
starting out and I'm still new to project-based learning um, with children and with adults um, would be like, well, can I do this? My kids don't have the skills for this. And it's really important to think, A, kids might have more skills in this than we recognize, but we don't give them the opportunity to demonstrate those skills in a traditional instructional setting. Um, and B, to the extent that they don't yet have those skills, this is actually how we help them develop them, right? Like they're not gonna just magically show up one day possessing those skills and ready to engage successfully in project-based learning. We, we say, hey, you're at where you're at and I'm gonna scaffold for you, I'm going to support you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to hone those skills in, in an environment that's safe and supportive and actually will provide you feedback along the way so that you can be successful and have a learning a safe um, learning experience. And this list that you'll see on your screen right now, um, these are all things that, that project-based learning provides an opportunity to address with and for students in a really meaningful and authentic way. Now, just as the learning is new for students and they're acquiring skills, we absolutely recognize that for a lot of educators, it's a new thing to try to teach in this way and uh, guide students through the process. And we also recognize that at this particular moment, you're being asked to do a lot, a lot of new things that you don't have experience with. So that has not escaped our notice. And that's why for this particular project, we have a lot of scaffolds built in to support you. A couple of barriers that in general, not just in this time, um, tend to get in the way of teachers trying project-based learning are assessment and then alignment to content standards. For assessment, as Matt said, um, it's not that you're not assessing the work. We're saying anything goes. It's that you're changing the way that you assess and the frequency of the assessment to look more at the student process rather than just the outcome at the very end. And we have a lot of rubrics that will help guide you through that for your particular context. In addition to that, and we'll talk more about this later, um, we will have SCO mentors that are working with you and will help you navigate which rubrics work the best or how might I modify these for my particular context to give students some authentic feedback and to help us assess um, where are they at in this process and what, what do they still need to support. So the other thing that really gets in the way, particularly for secondary, I will say, is how do I possibly teach my content that I am charged with teaching in the context of project-based learning? Um, there are a number of ways that you can do that in any PBL context, but one of the reasons we chose this particular topic of community for this project is because it connects really well with a lot of different content areas. Um, We'll go through these more in session two, but if you look on the website for the project, there are already connections called out for the history social science framework, for NGSS, for ELA, and for math. And there are a number of other connections for other subject areas that you might be teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that you really should be able to teach some of the content in the context of this. It's not an extra thing that you're smashing in on top of everything else that you have to teach. Because it's new for a lot of people, we'll have content specialists that from SCO that will work with you and help you align everything to your content area. Uh, again, session two, which uh, for this group will be at two o'clock today, specifically looks at brainstorming, how would this fit within my particular um, content area? But community, there's any number of ways that you could connect that. It's a pretty low hanging fruit. So the timeline for this project, uh, when we came up with this, we understood that distance learning is a, a difficult challenge for teachers uh, throughout the country. And we wanted to help them get started with a project that we could support as much as possible. We also understood that uh, we didn't want to start the first day of school because many of you will not know your students. Uh, you're gonna have brand new students, not like at the end of last year where you knew the students and you went into distance learning. So we want to give you a little bit of time to get to know your students before you embark on this project. Um, so our official start date is going to be August 31st. The project is designed for the next four weeks after that, um, where we will give you specific support each week. And as Anna said, we will provide you with a mentor who will reach out to you, will we'll email you resources, will check in with you on occasion and make sure you have everything you need to get this project going. That being said, we are um, supporting you. We are not taking over your classes. We're not gonna be, it's not like SCO is gonna teach my classes for a month um, because everybody's gonna be adjusting this project slightly differently depending on the content area they're doing, the grade level. Um, 
So what the timeline will look like, um, we'll start out um, on that first week with a project launch. SCO will create a video of uh, what is community with community members um, of various and from various different parts of Sonoma County talking about what they believe community is, just to kind of whet the student's appetite about what community is. Um, you are then going to come up with a secondary question on how you're going to um, align this to your content. And we'll talk about that more in session two or you could allow the students to choose what that secondary question is if you wanna work with your students on that. Um, and then you'll have a launch and, and I'll let Ryan briefly talk about um, a launch he's done with an elementary class before. Up here, muted, Ryan. Huh. No, I'm on mute now. So um, an example of project that, uh, project that I did uh, a couple years ago, again, project launches can look um, many different ways. But um, it was around the time that Rona Park was thinking about um, updating the general plan and uh, making improvements for the city. So I thought, well, I'll ask my first graders, what do they think? And so I worked with the city manager. Um, he came to our school and he um, asked the students, how can we make our community a better, more interesting place? And he talked about the different components of a city. And so having that community expert be that person to launch the project instead of myself made it more authentic. And in this time of distance learning, you might want to reach out to a community member who can make a video who can help launch the project. But um, you have to, um, time in session two to think of and brainstorm ways you want to launch your project. So once you have the idea for the launch, um, you're going to figure out what, what driving question you have and what problem your students are going to um, solve. We're also going to decide how you're going to work with your groups. Are you going to do this as an entire class? Are you going to do small groups or, or large groups and decide that um, and decide how much of it you want to let your students decide on the driving question or if you want to control that in the first one. Um, we'll also offer a webinar on how students can uh, collaborate better with uh, distance learning tools um, and how they can document their, their progress as they're going forward. So week two, uh, there'll be lots of feedback between students and between um, you and the students. So we will before that offer a webinar on how to give feedback to students and protocols you can use, which are gonna be in our resource folder. Uh, the students will begin doing their initial inquiry and trying to solve this real world problem. Um, and then they'll make a prototype and the prototype um, will explain what that looks like in some of the resources later on. Um, but that's what you're going to give feedback on. So you can know the direction your students are going before they go too far down the road and make sure that, um, that they have the support they need and they're going to be able to pull that off. Then on week three, um, their students are going to be getting ready for their presentation and their public exhibition. So we will have a webinar before that talking about different tools and different ways that people might be able to present. Um, they will also have um, their prototype with some of the adjustments they've made based on the feedback they got from somebody else. They'll get additional feedback and you'll give um, some progress to the students using one of the, one of the rubrics. And then week four will be the public exhibition. Um, the, once they do the public exhibition, as Ryan said, there's a PBL reflection. We have a document that helps lead uh, students through the reflection. We'll do a webinar. On, on how students can do that reflection and then the final evaluation with the teacher. So each of these weeks, we will provide you with support. We'll give you um, handouts for students and we'll, we'll guide you through what to do week by week with this. Was there a slide before this, Matt? There is a slide before this. Okay. Perfect. All right, so as Matt was um, talking about, the public exhibition will be one of the pieces that the SCO team will be able to support you in and thinking of ideas and brainstorming. But uh, essentially at the end of a PBL unit, students make their learning visible through um, products, things that they create. And they're meant to be presented to a public audience to make it, make it authentic. So you have time to think about who you want your students to present to and why. Uh, for instance, we present to our city council um, with the project that I mentioned. So um, ideas for public audiences could be the school board meeting, uh, Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, school admin, school community, families, business or a business group. And most importantly, during this time of distance learning is how are you going to um, execute the public exhibition, knowing that we cannot bring, you know, 
a huge gathering together? Is it going to be through video, through a web, maybe a website, a Flipgrid, maybe an ebook, or physical physical products that your students create and possibly send out? So you'll have time to think about um, what this will look like in your context. And I see that some wheels are turning. Um, Matt can speak best to the question of, can this tie into the stipend for collaboration afterwards? Um, do you want to talk about that as we talk about support for scale? It, it absolutely can. And um, we, we wanted to make sure that this was, if you design this project and you modify it yourself, this will absolutely uh, be eligible for that stipend. And along with that, you'll get a lot of support. So again, we recognize that this is new for a lot of people and there's a lot of new learnings that you're doing. And so we wanna make sure that you have every resource possible to feel like you could be successful in this and that your students could be. So if you choose to sign up to do this, you'll be assigned a project-based uh, learning mentor from SCO. And this mentor, as Matt said, they're not doing the project for you, but they're checking in with you along the way, checking in with um, questions that your class has, and also providing you a lot of resources on the project. Everything from helping you brainstorm, what might the driving question be for my particular students in our context, to um, what kind of resources do the students need to build skills in this area, to what kind of authentic audience can we tap into uh, to share our, our findings with or to bring in at the beginning to give the students some extra learning. We're not doing all of that for you, but we're providing you with the links, with the contacts, with um, all the things that you might need. If you are interested in signing up, I'm putting the link in the chat right now. This goes to a form that you would fill out to say, yes, I'm interested in learning more. And there's a few things that that will do for you. One is it will give your contact information to us so we can get you information about when webinars are, we can um, link you with a mentor, we can field any of your questions. But another really critical piece is because we're doing this countywide, that will also give you access to other educators who are interested in this. Um, one of our greatest strengths is that we have a lot of diversity among educators in the context that they're in and the experience that they have. We also know that because we have so many districts, oftentimes you don't have as many colleagues directly at your school. Like you might be the only 10th grade science teacher at a particular school, but there might be another 10th grade science teacher at another school who's also trying this project. Um, and we can provide you all with each other's contact information so that you can work together and learn from each other and share resources. Now, one thing on the form, uh, for those who get nervous about committing to too much at once, we're not tracking you down and holding your feet to the fire if you say, yes, I'm interested, and then something changes. Um, but if you don't sign up, we don't know that you're interested, and we can't get you all the resources. So it's better to sign up and learn more and explore what might be possible than to not do that at all. So the upcoming session that SCO will be able to provide you with um, more uh, substance with this project and, and, and support and a little bit more about this, uh, about this topic that we're embarking on together, community. Uh, session two is connection to content, uh, which will go over content integration, how to think about your subject areas and how to make it more integrated. Um, and session three, we'll talk about customizing your project and thinking about planning your project and go over examples as well. Yeah, especially um, in session two, um, it's really gonna, give you ideas from, from those uh, subject area content where the connection is and you can also see what other people are thinking. So it will help you sp help spark some other ideas. Session three is really going to be a work session where we'll give you a template to, to work with so you can start really putting down some ideas on paper and um, we can support you in, in how to move this project forward so you have a better understanding of what it might look like for your class. And again, session two for secondary is at two o'clock today. However, if you can't make that and you really want to um, explore content connections, you can also go to the elementary one. It's, you'll be, still be able to brainstorm a lot of ideas. So we'll be doing um, several different webinars for for you throughout this as i mentioned earlier here are the dates for some of the webinars and we will probably add a couple additional ones but these are definitely already calendared um, and these will be on thursdays at 3 30 so we'll have collaboration and documentation will be the first one feedback 
and presentation and finally project reflection because all these are things that you are going to need to know about. If you can't attend these webinars, we will record them and we will send those out to emails to you ahead of time. So you'll get them um, the, the Thursday before that week where in our timeline that we, we anticipate you would be doing that type of work with your students. All of the resources for, for everything uh, that we're doing we talked about today are in a Google Drive folder. It's at bit.ly slash Sonoma PBL. Um, and I'm gonna go to that folder now and show you some of the resources that are there. I think Anna's putting it in the chat as well. So the first one is team collaboration. In that folder are going to be um, contracts for different student groups about what their different roles are. Um, so how you might want to organize uh, student groups. So that will help you with that. Um, the second one uh, will be information. It'll be the slide deck from this session. And once we're done, I'll put the video in that folder. And then you see the chats from, um, from these uh, sessions will also be in there. The third one is project planning. This is for teachers. This is not a, a student project planning, but this is for teachers to really outline um, and plan what the project's going to look like and schedule it out. Um, we've got some templates and we're going to focus greatly on that in session three. Next folder is on feedback where we have some protocols on how students can give and receive feedback. So it helps them um, during that time. Um, obviously elementary challenges, uh, don't really apply to you, but you can look at them and there might be some inspiration in there because um, if, if you've seen some of Ryan's work, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing what he accomplishes with kindergartners. Um, and then career contacts, these are um, people that Ryan has um, found in the community and Ryan, I don't know if they'd be open to working with high school. Oh, for sure, yes, they, they, they're definitely, definitely open. Mm -hmm. So you wanna talk a little bit about that, those contacts? Yeah, so these are contacts that I've built over the years um, in my PBL units. Um, so there are contacts in the uh, fire department, police department, um, teachers at university or chemistry teachers, um, just any community member who I've worked with in a PBL unit who my students either interviewed or got more information um, from. Um, and they said they're more than, more than willing to support teachers in their PBL units, so elementary and secondary. And we also have contacts through the CTE Foundation and can find professionals in different areas. So once we know where your focus is going to be, we can help uh, connect you with professionals. All right, so um, if you had questions in the chat, um, we're gonna go to those questions. Now I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. One that has come up is um, just speaking more to the, the feasibility of doing this across different classes. So for example, somebody said they are PE teacher and um, they have five different classes. Is it reasonable to try to do this project across those classes? I, I guess I, I need more about the question. You mean be, with a number of students or? Laurel can speak to it better, but I believe that is with that sheer number of students, how would PBL work? Yeah, it's, it depends on how you want to approach it um, and, and what your individual focus is. Um, managing large numbers of students obviously is, is difficult, but if, um, remember, we're transferring the agency from you to the students, so you're guiding them through that. Um, I think if you, if you come up with some compelling driving questions that are going to interest the students, it is going to help them, them stay focused. Um, not all the assessment is going to come from you, as, as you saw in there, some of the feedback is peer to peer. Um, so that takes a little bit off your plate. You also have, um, I would say the difficulty might come in if you have 20 groups in each class, right? If you have, and then you're trying, and they're all doing different things, trying to link up all those professionals. So I would try and um, narrow your scope into a little bit where maybe you could get four or five professionals um, that could work with the students. That would be a little easier to, to bite off. One thing that Matt will share in, I believe it's in session three, is a slide all about the different levels of inquiry from where it's really more teacher directed all the way to it where it's very free form student directed. And there's no rule on which one you should start with. You do what works best for your context because you want it to be successful for you and for the students. 
And if it totally doesn't work for the, the sections that you have or the students that you have, then don't do that option. Try something else because the, the more you develop it for your particular context, the more successful it will be. And we understand that for many of you, this is your first attempt at doing PBL and you have to anticipate it's going to be messy at times, both for you and for the students, but that's where the real learning happens. Um, as Brian, do you want to talk a little bit about the messy middle? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so in session two, as we noted that you'll get a chance to brainstorm ideas for your PBL unit and um, from experience knowing that, you know, planning my units at the beginning of the year or whenever I'm going to start a project, I know what standards I'm going to be teaching. I, I know I'm thinking about ways to engage my students in this topic and make it interesting and relevant. But as I implement this project, I know it will change and being okay that it will change because you're going to be going with your students and their interests and their questions. But again, keeping in mind what you'll be teaching and your overall arching goal for that. So it's okay to um, deviate from the plan, but um, you're going with the students and their learning. And there's questions about, um, will you have access to other teachers' work? And the answer is yes, absolutely. We're highly, highly encouraging that people share what they're working on, that they build off of each other's. It is very scary if you're in it all by yourself and you're just hanging out there. And that is not the intent of this. The intent is that you have support from the county level, from people that have done PBL before, and from the other teachers that are trying it out so that everyone can learn together and everyone can use resources from each other. One of the questions on the form is, are you willing to collaborate or do, are you interested in collaborating with another teacher? And it's yes, no, or maybe. And even if you click maybe, um, we can see if you have similar type backgrounds or, or subject areas that you're teaching or if, if there's information that you want and we can help connect those teachers. So it's not all on you to, to look through that list. Um, we can help connect you with somebody else as well. One of the things I wanted to add was, um, you know, as we design this, one of the things we have been thinking about is, you know, if our, our overarching kind of theme is what is community. We want to encourage community in the way we do the work, right? So community amongst yourselves as educators um, and and then as you kind of paying it forward towards your students, community amongst the students and community amongst the students and um, the community and their family. Um, so community isn't just the theme of the content, but also something to think about. The It's the way we do the work as well. And just to put a plug in, so I uh, run a science teacher leader collaborative that's countywide. And one of the things they've worked on this summer and they're actually presenting on tomorrow is um, just resources that science teachers can use in distance and hybrid learning. And it's really cool what they've come up with, but what's even cooler is just the way that they balance off each other's ideas. And they're from different districts, different schools, different grade levels, some are uh, first grade, some are high school, and yet they're all learning from each other and their practice is richer because of that. And this is an opportunity for everyone to tap into that kind of network that is rare when we're in our classrooms. Okay, are there any more questions? No question too big or too small. We know that PBL is new for a lot of people and we may have used words that you're like, what, what does that even stand for? Please ask. Uh, good question about the sessions being recorded. Yes, they are all being recorded and they will get put into the same folder with the resources. Um, so if you can't attend a session, absolutely, you can go back and look, look at the recordings. You can also reach out to us if it doesn't make sense and you want to talk through an idea more. We're happy to schedule a time with you. One caveat on the recordings is that it does take a little while to get them downloaded, to get them re-uploaded for Google Drive to recognize that they're there and process them. So it's not immediate that right after the session that the video will be there, but it will get uploaded. Matt, session three for secondary tomorrow, I believe, is at two o'clock. Let me confirm for tomorrow's session for secondary, session three mm -hmm. is at, uh, no, session three is at 11 for secondary. Just kidding. Thank you. <laughs> two o'clock is the elementary one. Good that we clarified. Mm -hmm. yes. 
Um, great question. Is there a person facilitating collaboration in humanities? Absolutely. Both Matt and Kelly have a lot of expertise in that and we'll be there for you. Yeah, um, with I'm a former history teacher and um, for 15 years and I've got uh, been working uh, with the state in the rollout for the history social science framework. So I've got tons of um, ideas in that area. If you if you need some some help bouncing ideas off someone and Kelly works alongside me with that as well doing elementary um, history social science and she does high school ELA as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I the sorry. title that I, I, I referenced that as long includes English language arts, um, history, social studies, and universal design for learning. Um, and then I also, um, in addition to being happy to collaborate myself, I would love, I, one of my favorite things is finding patterns and connections between content areas. Um, but I also um, am happy to um, connect you with other folks in the community too, who, who might be, um, have even deeper or richer expertise, um, educators in the educational community. One of the things that, um, that many of us like to do is connect um, people in the community with professionals. We see some, and an example of that is in next week's session, we have one on iNaturalist because uh, my brother was using it the summer I was camping. He showed it to me, I used it. And then I said, this would be great for, for teachers to use. We reached out to the, um, one of the uh, head people at iNaturalist and he's presenting a session on there and that would work well in NGSS with community if you're looking at a natural community. So, so we can help you find professionals in any area. And one of the nice things with distance learning is it's really an easy ask for people because they don't have to drive to your classroom and come in. They could do a Zoom call. You know, it could take 15 minutes or so out of their day. And most people are willing to say, yes, we found. And I'm, I apologize to Elisa, I may have misinterpreted the question. I think she might have been asking about a larger uh, collaborative for humanities that would be ongoing. And this would be a great spot to launch that as there's interest and as people form connections, certainly you could keep meeting. Collaboration doesn't have to stop with one project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing we've, we failed to mention is we are going to do additional PBL units throughout the year. We definitely will have one on the election. Um, coming forward, but if you also have ones that you definitely want to see going forward to and want to be involved in developing, uh, we'd love some input on some topics that, that you would, you'd want to see, even if it's just humanities or if it's just science or, or if we want to integrate any of them. And this particular topic actually came out of teacher feedback, so we really do listen. We initially thought a cool question would be, is COVID-19 good or bad for the world? Which is intriguing because you can make a lot of arguments, but we heard from teachers what they really wanted support on was how do we form community if we're starting the year with distance learning? Like, how is that even possible? And so we pivoted and um, shifted to community in response to that. So make your ideas known because they actually do influence what happens. And you may also, um, you may also as if, if you engage in this one around community, some of your students thinking and questions and, and, and work that they come up with or, or even through other um, work that you do with your students, keep your ear to the ground to what they're passionate about. Keep your ear to the ground about what they're curious about, um, what's, what's happening in their lives. And, and we would love input around that as well. Um, because the more we can center work around students' um, interests and, um, and curiosities, the better the work will be. Absolutely. Coming from the elementary realm, I'm currently developing a unit focused on community and knowing that I won't be able to see my students um, in person and thinking about ways um, to design a project around that. So the driving question that um, I'm working with a teammate on is, um, what can we do to get to know each other and build a classroom community in this distance learning environment? So I'm putting on the students to, okay, what can we do to get to know each other? How can I know about your families? How can I know about your pets? What can we do? So um, through that, um, the content comes into place, history, social studies, uh, neighborhoods, you know, map making, um, community building activities, um, math comes into play, maybe surveying, you know, how many people live in their home, how many pets do they have, um, what do they like to do, just getting to know them. And so um, something I'm thinking about as um, we go through this topic. And I think too, to build on what Ryan said, um, I'm a person that uh, I'm really bad at small talk. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, and, and, and I say that because I think one of the things is I have a hard time with like kind of the, the surface level like chat or icebreaker kind of get to know you stuff like for better or for worse I just like to like dive into the meaty stuff and I think it's because um 
and and I bring this up because I feel like sometimes I think the best way to get to know each other is in doing this work together, right? So these questions that Ryan's posing to his kids, he didn't think to himself, oh, well, it's going to be hard to build community. So here are the different um, icebreakers and learning activities I'm going to do, but he's actually opening it up and saying like, I want to know you, how might I get to know you? right? Mm -hmm. And so that in and of itself is going to create a deeper knowing of one another. And then moving on from there, if and when he does more um, project-based learning work with his students, um, opening up and doing the work together will develop much deeper relationships than any sort of um, kind of more surface level um, get to know you or community building activity. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions have come up. Uh, Matt, do you know off the top of your head when the iNaturals presentation is? It, it's not during this week's session. It's during next week's session. Um, I, I know it's um, from two to three. I want to say Thursday. Um, but I'm not positive. It's either Wednesday or Thursday, two to three, but I can find that out. But that will be recorded too. Um, so even if you are in this session of the Summer Institute, you can go back and watch that. Um, I see. Yeah. Go ahead you're probably going to address the same one. How do you push out or share uh, the projects that are being developed? How are we doing that so that other colleagues that aren't here can uh, learn about them? Will the website continue to be? Yeah. That, so, so even if you're not participating in the summer Institute, you can still participate in this PBL thing. This is separate from the summer Institute. Um, we include it because we knew a lot of people would be interested, but if you have colleagues or people who just want to participate in this PBL unit, um, scocommunityproject.org is the website where all the information will be. The sign up form will be there. So, so direct any colleagues that might be interested in this. They don't have to be in the Summer Institute to participate. But we'll also put these videos on that website. So if they didn't participate in the Summer Institute, they could still watch some of these uh, helpful videos. And then I believe uh, future projects that are developed will go to the same website. Um, it's called Sonoma Community Projects. We might have a different website. Um, but if you're on this sign up list, we'll definitely um, email it out to you and we'll email it out to principals. Um, we're not allowed to direct email to all teachers in Sonoma County, but we'll definitely send a bulk email out to, um, to all teachers. And then in the SCO um, newsletter that goes out, we'll make sure there's a link to that. To all principals, you mean? Or all uh, there's, I think there's a newsletter that teachers can sign up for. Yeah. And if you search classes, it'll be on there as well. And once we have you on a roster that you are interested, we can send direct emails to you. So if you're signing up for this, you'll continue to get information. I also, um, I see Elise, um, Elise Turner uh, made a comment in the, in the chat about anti-racism, right? And I'm super excited to see that in there. Um, I think that that's been on a lot of our minds, especially lately. And I know for many of us, it's something that we've been thinking and talking about for a while, for a long time. Um, and, and I want to say that, A, I think it could make an amazing focus for a project-based um, learning experience for students. And no matter what your explicit focus is, intentionally designing, thinking, and planning with anti-racism as a lens, both as an educator as you do, do that, and with your students in whatever your, your, your focus is, can be, is incredibly powerful. And that's another piece that we're happy to work alongside, think alongside, offer mentorship and guidance to say, hey, even if your, your overarching focus is something around community and, and, and ecosystems, right? And like doesn't have a, an explicit or, or overt anti-racist lens, how do we take an anti-racist lens in designing and implementing that work and engaging students in that work? Um, so again, I can feel my energy come up in my, you know, I could go on all day about it, but I won't, but, but yes, absolutely anti-racism and, and how, do we, how do we do this? Someone in the, in, in the elementary session, uh, the one right before this. Just real quick, I, we're pushing up on the end, so we do have a hard stop time at, at 10.30. So. Yes. This is really quick. Thanks. She uh, had the idea of using this particular PBL unit to t tell the untold stories of students and others around, um, around the class. And that is certainly something you could translate to secondary as well. And we do have resources we can share on that. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we will be back for sessions two and se sessions three. Please email us in the meantime if you have any questions. And we will put this recording up shortly. Sorry to, to end quickly, but we know that people have other sessions and we don't want to stop you from getting to those sessions on time.
Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.